Hello and welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today we have an interview with Chase Palmer, co-writer and director of the new film Naked Singularity. The film stars John Boyega as an idealistic young New York City public defender burned out by the system, on the brink of disbarment, and seeing signs of the universe collapsing all around him. I am a public defender for the U.S. criminal justice system. You have the power to waive a mandatory minimum. Next docket. Once you fall in, it's almost impossible to get out. Tough week for you, champ. My client pleads not guilty, Your Honor. Get out. With all due respect. But what if you can beat the system at its own game? So this guy asked if I'd help him out. My buddy's car got jacked. You let me know it's there? He offered me a hundred grand if I'd grab a sample of the heroin stashed inside that navigator. Why risk it? I don't want to live my life looking at lost opportunities. Let me post this hypo. We could steal said monies without detection. I still wouldn't do it. Why not? Because it's wrong. It's wrong? It's, It's wrong. It's wrong? Think about what it can do. One can break the law, my friend, and still believe in justice. That isn't the first spliff you've had tonight, is it? Someone's gonna see $15 million all in one room. Think of the lives that could change. I'm in. This guy has me freaked. You better not be trying to get in the middle of something that has nothing to do with you. The her said. This is our chance to carve our names across the back ass of the universe. Legacy time. The cops, I think they know. There's been a wrinkle. A Mexican cartel. They're here. This is what I do. Busting my ass trying to level the playing field. Oh, we said no guns. It's tear gas. Plus, it looks badass as shit. Chase and I discuss the different genres the story jumps between, the role the city of New York plays in the film, and more. Check it out. Chase Palmer, writer and director of Naked Singularity. How are you doing? I'm doing well today. I'm doing well. Thank you. All right. For folks who haven't had a chance to see the trailer or anything, how would you describe the, the movie? Oh, I, you know, it's sort of a legal, metaphysical, legal heist thriller. <laughs> that actually it segues right into my first question, which is this movie kind of, you know, it, it touches several different genres. And I'm curious what your, you know, relationship is with genre films and what your approach on this film was, you know, in terms of balancing the different genres that you were working in. I mean, I, you know, I love I love working in genre. I love the sandbox, you know, the, playing in different sandboxes and and, you know, knowing the rules of, of the, you know, those genres, the sort of the previous films that have sort of, you know, played in that sort of, you know, sandbox. And it gives you an opportunity to kind of do a deep dive into a genre and get to know it really well. So I think, I, you know, that part of it I enjoyed to understand like where what you're doing kind of, you know, lays within the the larger you know conversation about films in that particular genre so i love i love that part of it i mean with this this film in particular you know there are two very specific genres that you're sort of trafficking and you're dealing with the you know the the new york kind of legal drama at the beginning of the film and then you have you know a a heist movie a sort of a you know a elmore leonard-esque heist crime film in the second half and i think you're trying to unify those two tones which are which are you know inherently kind of different and you know and then we have this additional third layer of the film which is this these sort of metaphysical kind of flights of fancy that that happened with the ripples and cassie's sort of looking at the universe collapsing around him so (laughs) i'm juggling these three things and you know i i'm just in order to make them unified i you 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 know, you kind of have to rebalance everything. So I think you make the courthouse stuff is a little more heightened and to sort of match up to all of the, you know, the genre heist stuff. But, but that, all that works out well because that really, you know, the, the unifying sort of voice of the film, I, I hope, is it comes from the book, which is the reason I wanted to do this is, you know, the author Sergio de la Pava is a public defender. 
uh, of 20 years. His wife, Susanna, is a public defender of 20 years. You know, he wrote this book that is a very, you know, well-observed, funny, absurdist, kind of outraged, you know, novel that, you know, that, that juggles in all these different kind of genres. But there was something very specific about his voice. It was, it was like a new way into having a discussion about social justice. And it was sort of a new way into seeing, you know, a story about a young public defender. I thought it was a little bit more kind of wild and funny and just different. So, so I wanted to take that voice and try to, you know, uh, get it through the whole film. And that's sort of where the tone comes from, really. It comes from the book. And then trying to, you know, make it work filmically, which is, as you know, with writing is, you know, Alexander Payne has that great quote where tone isn't built in a day. You know, it's a juggling act and you're continuing to refine and trying to find the exact right balance of all the elements so that the tone hopefully, you know, unifies. And, you know, you, you use the word metaphysical and the, the, that sort of aspect of the film. It's, there's some, you know, surreal so stylistic touches throughout the film. And I'm curious, that kind of stuff is, you know, definitely the sort of we've seen courtroom stuff. We've seen heist stuff that, that lives relatively in the real world. But then this stuff sort of sets, sets it apart. As you said, it's kind of a new way into this type of story. And I'm curious, was there a sort of push pull with, you know, including more of it, including less of it, you, you know, trying to find that right balance? Oh, with the ripples you're, you're talking yeah. about? Like, yeah, yeah. No, we, we had more of them in the script and probably in different ones in the script in terms of, you know, and, and to anybody who doesn't know, the ripples, what we're talking about are these sort of moments where we're, we kind of either are getting into Cassie's head at these sort of emotional kind of pivotal moments and he's seeing something kind of not right with the universe or it's a literal uh, literalization of what... Tim Blake Nelson's character is talking about it, that the universe is collapsing around us. And these are these are events that are, you know, manifest to Cassie. E either either of those explanations might, you know, might hold up, but but we call them these ripple moments. And yes, we just made we kept adjusting them throughout. I mean, even, even in post, we came up with sort of new, you know, different versions than what we wrote, because, you know, we felt like we weren't quite landing what we wanted to get out of the moment as written. So you're, you're just constantly balancing and rebalancing stuff. And how important is it to have someone like Tim Blake Nelson to, you know, play a character like that, who's, you know, talking about all this otherworldly crazy stuff, but, you know, because it's Tim Blake Nelson, you, 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 there's a, there's a gravitas to it that lets you as a viewer kind of absorb it more fully. How, how, what is it like when you have someone like him playing a character like that? I mean, he's such a smart actor and he's also a filmmaker who's, who's a terrific filmmaker. And so he's, a, he's a, an, an intimidating guy to, to work with only because he always has something to add to make it better and, 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 you know, asks really good questions that, you know, makes you continue to, you know, refine and try to get the best out of the scene. And, you know, as you, as you said, like you, you know, we have this character who's, sort of maybe explaining the metaphor of the film a little bit and you need and, you know i wanted to have a heady actor somebody who was really smart that you, you could believe could could articulate this message in a way that was also fun and kind of quirky and, and weird and and uniquely tim blake you know nelson so mm -hmm. you mentioned you know earlier talking about the characters you, you referenced elmore leonard and there is a definite sort of elmore leonard even film noir -y vibe to the characters and you know there's there's double crosses and, you know, ulterior motives and things like that. And I'm curious when, you know, when you're writing that, even if though it's an adaptation, what, how do you, you know, decide when and how to disclose information and backstories and stuff to the audience? What, what, what is your approach to that to make sure that, you know, to, on the one hand, maintain mystery, but on the other hand, you know, you don't want the audience to be completely in the dark the whole time. I, you know, I think you start with character first, you know, I, I think in every scene you, you try to be in those characters' shoes and make sure that if they're if they're giving you know just expository information that it comes from you know a character based you know reason and it, it and it's motivated pro properly you know because I think there's nothing worse than just sort of you know doing info dumps that can feel like just a waste of a scene to an extent right you're just sort of stopping the movie to give information and then move on so I think that you know one is always trying to kind of smuggle in you know moving some of the plot stuff forward through character and that's the most sort of pressing thing that you, you that you need to do uh, you know and then I think when you're in the edit I mean you really are rewriting it and figuring out where in the script, it's things move so much faster in, in movie time than script time. And so as somebody who's written for other directors and mostly been a screenwriter, you know, I learned a lot as a director because you, you just see that things that read land differently than things that you see. And so you have to make those adjustments. Mm -hmm. And how important it was New York for you in this movie? Because, you know, well, I, I'm from New York and watching the film, it's it seems sort of 
inextricably tied to the the city. So was that something you, you know, I I, imagine, I know it's from the book, but is that something you also were just like, it, New York has to, this has to be in New York because of the nature of the story? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've i lived in New York for 20 some years. You know, Sergio was, you know, distinctly commenting on what he was seeing in these you know, Manhattan courtrooms. And I, you know, and I wanted to make sort of a love letter to the city I've lived in that reflected a city that I don't see as much, you know, in film these days. Like it's a little bit, you know, it's a, it's a bit more of a shiny, you know, more slick object. And, you know, it still has like the apparatus that keeps the city running is still there. And there's still these sort of fringe kind of areas of the city that are, you know, they're that feel like they were, they haven't changed much in, you know, 30 years. And and so I, I, I kind of, our approach, both in production design and kind of the color and, the, you know, the, this noir kind of approach that you're talking about was always like, let's, let's, you know, New York is sort of the, the vinyl version of a contemporary band, right? Like that was like our, our North star on this whole thing. So you could have, you know, it, it's a, it, is a movie that's taking place today, but there is this, this, this patina of kind of retroness to it that is kind of makes it, you know, is cool. It's a bit of a nod to the Elmore Leonard stuff. Mm -hmm. It is a nod to the fact that we are shooting, you know, we were shooting in, in you know, 100 Center Street and we had to, you know, replicate a tow pound and we're on the waterfront. So all these places already look kind of retro anyway. And so we were trying to have fun with that, you know, the built-in kind of look and feel of the movie. And, and also to your point about tone at the beginning of this whole thing, it allows you to sort of unify it in a way that makes it a little bit heightened. It's, just, it's you know, it's like the naked singularity version of the city. So we could have this sort of, you know, unique tone to the to the film that was a little bit not fully reality. For sure. Just on a nuts and bolts level, when you're adapting something versus, you know, starting from scratch, what's your process? Are you going through the book and, you know, picking out scenes or sections that you, you know need to be in there, calling, cutting out things that aren't? How do, how do you, what's the, you know, the process for you? Well, I think with a book, you know, the first thing is just like, what's the spirit of the book? You know, and, and like embody, trying to like really get into your head. And, uh, like what's, what, what do you love about it? And what's the spirit of it before even getting into like the nuts and bolts of what characters are you going to cut and consolidate and plot points? It's just sort of understanding what you're writing from the book. What, what are you extracting totally? from it and then then it is then it's like and then we did this with it as well it's like what what scenes have to be in the movie to make it the book right like it wouldn't feel like naked singularity if there weren't a couple of key moments in the film and so you start in that way especially with with larger adaptations that are you know 700 800 900 pages is like just one of the key set pieces sequences or scenes that have to be in the movie and then you start building around those you start building around like you know now how do i if that's going to take up 40 50 pages of the script now i only have another 80 to work with then you start having to make the tough choices of how do i consolidate and streamline and get from one point to the other and you know so i just take these sort of baby steps forward to get to a place where okay I've, you've wrestled with it you've wrestled it down then you can start getting granular about like who you're going to cut and you know what what scenes you're going to consolidate and how do you you know invent new things that were never in the book but feel like they were in the book you know mm -hmm. taking a kind of a big step back when did you first know you wanted to you know be a storyteller write movies oh man i mean my parents like always took us to every friday night we go to a movie theater watch movies in colorado and then every sunday we would you know go down to the video store we lived up in the mountains so we'd have to drive like 40 minutes to the video store and then come home and watch Sunday night movies. So they they are they were always huge film fans. And I, you know, just started loving movies, watching them with them. And, you know, we would watch very inappropriate stuff for kids. Like <laughs> they'd take us to like fatal attraction in the movie theater when I was like five or something <laughs> like that. You know, or we'd watch like David Lean movies. And so it was just great. And they they would we just watch everything. We could get our hands on. You know, I love movies early on. I I by the time I was in college, I kind of knew I wanted to be a filmmaker and, you know, I, I didn't go to film school, but was trying to figure out what, you know, how do you do it? You know, and I moved to New York and, and just started to get involved in the, in the film community any way I could, you know, just to see, you know, get on a few productions here and there, see how film sets worked and you go from there. But I just, I just love movies and, and wanted to be involved in that business. I didn't know what that meant, but I felt <laughs> like, you know, just dive right in. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as your career develops, what's your relationship with your representation with the managers and agents? Because, I, you know, there's always a lot of misconceptions about out there about, you know, what what either one does and, you know, how it affects your career as a writer. What's your sort of relationship with your representation? I mean, I've been I've been very lucky insofar. I've you know, I, they've been with me since the beginning and we 
we are friends and they are allies, you know, especially living in New York, you know, having eyes and ears in LA all these years was extremely, you know, helpful. You know, I've had a, a fr- friends who've had not great experiences with reps. I think part of it, I think to, to have a successful relationship or at least my successful relationship is th- do they truly like, like and get what you're trying to do? And that may not be, you know, making, you know, the most high budget, you know, studio fair. Like you, you, you may not be the client that's going to make them a huge amount of, you know, money, but they respect what you're trying to do and, and they are an advocate for you and they and they vibe what you are trying to do. They're not going to try to put you in a box that you don't exist in. You know, and I, so I think finding somebody who like really is, is honest about what they want from, from you as a client up front and what you want as a filmmaker or a writer up front is, is helpful to have that conversation. So everyone's kind of on the same page, you know, and then also you have to like each other. For me, you're, you're talking to them all the time. So you have to like and trust them because if you don't, it'll just drive you crazy because they have to do a lot of work behind the scenes and you have to, you know, that they're, they're representing you well and they're telling you, you know, what's what. So, you know, it's, it's, you just got to feel each other out. It's it's a weird, it's a business relationship, but it's also, you know, an artistic relationship. There's, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> it's complicated. <Yeah>. So. <laughs> I think finding something, like you said, finding someone, you know, that you like and genuinely likes you and gets what you're, what you're trying to do is, is good advice for, for people. You, you know, you mentioned earlier working on it for you, you know, when you're a screenwriter, a gun for hire for, a, you know, a studio on that versus, you know, a writer, director driving a project like this, what's the, what's the difference for you? What's the, is there a difference to your approach? How does that, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, you know, especially if you're working for other directors, I mean, that, that, that's the most ideal scenario, I think as a screenwriter, because, you know, somebody in the room needs to have the point of view you know, the final sort of editorial point of view. And, and with a director, it, it, at least it's clear cut. You know, if, you, if you're just a screenwriter on the job, then I think it's your job to have that point of view and you have to sort of fight for it. But that gets, you know, you, you're competing with, you know, producers and studio execs who also have a point of view. I think whatever, whether it's studio or indie, like you have to know what you were trying to, to, to get out of it. Or you need to know, you know, who the main, the main actor is who has, whose point of view you're trying to, you know, channel. If you don't, if you can't answer that question, you, I think you get into trouble because then you don't know who you're writing for, or what you're writing for. And so that's for me, that's the number one thing is if I'm taking a studio job, I, I just want to know like, you know, who am I writing this for? And, and making sure that they know what they want. Beyond that, I think when you're writing for yourself as a, as a director, it's, it's easier to, I think, take, uh, you know, take some chances and also know that you're still figuring it out. Whereas in this, uh, you know, when, with assignments, you are trying to stick, you know, stick the landing in the window that you have to produce a draft. And that can be hard because, you know, writing is not a linear thing, right? Like you can, you can, you can try you can try a couple of different w- scenes out to get to the same point and that could take a couple of weeks you know mm-hmm. you just you just don't know and and when you have a ticking clock you have to be a little more decisive so i, I would say like with studio work you do get put in a position where you do have to be a little bit more decisive and you just got to you know make choices and jump a little bit and again that's where knowing who you're writing for and what you're writing toward is really important and are you someone who you, you know when you're starting out on a project whether it's some an original idea or an adaptation are you someone who outlines extensively does lots of note cards do you know or do you do, is there a lot of prep work before you get to the page or are you just diving right into the script what's your you know process in terms of that i think it depends i i don't i tend not to do the note cards i tend to to not write full treatments because i then i feel like i've written the film before i've written the the script and you know writing writing prose writing like you know this happens in a scene and then actually writing the scene is, are just two completely different things. What I do like to do is write probably like a four to five page kind of like, I wouldn't even say like an outline, it, it more kind of like uh, you know, outlines like the goals and the characters and like the major turning points and and sort of gives like a, you know, a, a you know, more open beat by beat kind of version of the film, but leaves enough like space for discovery and acknowledgement that like if you write directly to the treatment document there's something lifeless about like the script that you turn in i've I've had that many times where like you know I'll, i'll do a treatment step and it's helpful because everybody then knows what we're doing but inevitably you turn that in and then you're essentially just rewriting it, not from scratch, certainly, because you've done a lot of good, you sort of laid it on the page and finally you can see it in script format, but it's just not, 
you know, it's not going to be the movie. It's it's mm-hmm. just sort of a, a, the script version of, of the treatment versus the, <laughs> the, the script version of the movie. So, you know, I, I think it's important to, 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 to be prepared. I definitely do a ton of research. And, and that's my favorite part about screenwriting is you get to go and try to be a pseudo expert on whatever you're, you're working on for a couple of months and, and, you know, travel and read books and watch movies and kind of immerse yourself. That part of it's super fun and, and you know, is important. Yeah. Last question before we wrap up. Is there something you, you've learned over the course of your career so far that you wish you knew when you were first starting out? I mean, just from a, from a, like taking jobs level, I think I, being a little bit better at identifying, you know, what assignments were just assignments versus movies that had a better chance of getting made. You know, I think I have a better sense now of, of taking work, like what projects really do have a have a chance to sort of get there because there's just so many moving parts to getting any movie made. And, you know, in, early in your career, you're so lucky and you're so happy to get work. You're you're just writing, you know, to write. But, you know, I think I, I, it takes so much time and effort to write a script that you want to try to pick the, the right projects. So you're not, you know, writing into just writing into a corner. And, and yeah, it'll never get made. That's uh, that's a good note to end on. When can people see the film? It's going to be released in New York on August 6th. It will be released uh, everywhere else theatrically on the 13th. And it will also be on demand on the 13th. So very excited to, to get it out there and, you know, see how people react to our weird, wild film. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, congrats on the movie and thanks for taking the time to chat with me. Oh, thanks a lot, Phil. It was nice to chat. Thanks, Matt. Thanks to Chase Palmer for coming on the show. Naked Singularity is in theaters and streaming on Netflix right now. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you like this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Yeah.